today we're going to talk about navigating college with ADHD, setting yourself up for success. My name is Dr. Sharon Celine, and I'm thrilled to be here. I am a clinical psychologist practicing in Western Massachusetts, uh, where, there are, where there are five colleges um, in the area uh, where I live in Northampton. And so many of my clients are not just uh, teens with ADHD, but also emerging adults with ADHD. So let's get started. Now we know that transitioning to college is really about transitioning to adulthood. And in this presentation, I'm going to use college as an umbrella term. It is an umbrella term for vocational school, nursing school, um, community college, four-year college. All of these are going to be, encom be, uh, be uh, encompassed by the word college in this presentation. So I'm speaking directly to those of you who are in your, um, maybe your last year of, of high school, those of you who have started a transition to college, maybe that's been delayed because of the pandemic and you're at home, but you're really hoping that's where you'll be going. So transitioning to college. So this is a time when you're learning how to manage yourself with respect to showing up when you're supposed to, assessing situations for safety, uh, for comfort, um, and gauging your words and your actions accordingly. We're developing tools for managing emotions, the tidal waves of, a feel of feelings that um, kids and adults with ADHD experience, such as anxiety, anger, sadness, disappointment, maybe depression. This is a time when you're building awareness of your personal social needs for interaction and alone time, how to read a room and respond to a social situation appropriately. You're managing your medications and taking them. Of course, we know that pills don't teach skills, but they make you more available to learn and, re and retain tools. And you're using planning, organization, and persistence. These executive functioning skills help us get stuff done. And kids with ADHD need support to build these skills, but sadly often reject it. And the last executive functioning skill is self-evaluation, understanding yourself. It's also known as metacognition. And this is the last executive functioning skill to coalesce around age 25 in neurotypical brains. And you'll see, what is success in school and life? So to me, success is responding thoughtfully to challenges and knowing how to regroup. It's believing that you are good enough and have a personal value regardless of your accomplishments. It's being able to live with connected independence. You see that there are caring adults who can assist you or offer advice when you seek it. You feel like someone has your back. There's empathy for you in your situation from your parents or elders in your family. You're living your own life, but you have emotional or physical support as needed. And parents are there for you, but they're not running the show. You don't have to make this transition alone, and you probably shouldn't. You're capable, but at this stage in life, you may very well lack certain skills that you need to learn, and that's okay. Navigating institutions such as college, healthcare systems, car insurance, these are complicated things and they develop with experience and you're just about to start that process. What's the difference in terms of high school and college functioning? Well, um, I assume that most of you who are here are already diagnosed. If you're not, um, when you're in high school, you are still uh, surrounded by adults who are involved in your life have more, much more hands-on than in college, and they may see that you're struggling and refer you for an assessment. Your parents might refer you for an assessment. Your doctor might refer you for an assessment. And so um, in high school, kids often get assessed for ADHD. They, uh, actually, there also is a different scenario, which I'll talk about in a minute, where kids go to college and then they get diagnosed. Mostly in high school, you have set classes on a predetermined path. You need to take these classes to graduate. Someone's 
decided that for you. There are established routines and schedules determined by parents and educators and the school district. Um, you're partially responsible for yourself and you're developing the skills for independent living. Of course, students with ADHD, learning disabilities or ASD, autism spectrum uh, disorders, along with anxiety and depression do best when they have academic support during high school and then again in college, because those years between 18 and 23 are critical years because the brain is being programmed still to learn. Of course, our brains are programmed to learn our whole life. We call that neuroplasticity. But, because, but you're really ripe at this age to, to learn some solid skills and hold on to them. Um, services offered in high school include screening for and treating mental health issues, as well as providing instruction and services to improve executive functioning skills. And your parents, when you're in high school, can manage many aspects of your everyday living, food, shelter, health care, so you don't have to do that. When you go to college, you have to do that. So there's a lack of an external structure. You have classes a couple times a week, uh, but you create your days. Um, your classes um, may, be, um, may require you to manage all the aspects of them, how to get the, uh, there when you are. There are no adults to intervene uh, or advocate for you on your behalf. And only 16% of college students with ADHD access psychosocial treatment. So that would be educational and emotional support. And of course, at college, there are social and activity options 24-7, which can be very distracting. College students with ADHD. So there are apparently 6% of college students in the United States have been found to have ADHD. The male-female ratio is the same. It's three to one. Um, and there, um, what we see among college students with ADHD is higher rates of academic difficulties and dropping out, anxiety about perfectionism, making friends or keeping up, which affects both the social and academic life. Um, kids with ADHD who have a coexisting condition, whether that's a learning disability or a de um, they're depressed, tend to seek out services more than students who have ADHD or believe they only have ADHD. So what's the difference between high school and college for neurodiverse learners? Um, in, in high school, the ID, so in high school, the IDEA is a federal law that guarantees a free and appropriate education to all students in high school. No such law exists in college. It, kids with ADHD are categorized under the term of disability. So colleges do not have the same mandate as high schools to provide services. What they are regulated under is the Americans of Disabilities Act and other federal, federal regu regulations that provide for equal access to education and ban any practices that are discriminatory. Discriminatory, excuse me. So, where the IDEA is about facilitating academic achievement and progress, the ADA is about facilitating access to instruction. It's a civil rights issue. In high school, teachers can modify the content of the curriculum or assignments. College professors are not required to make modifications. In high school, material may be retaught, taught ahead, or discussed in class. In college, reading material may, may not be reviewed in class and is often dense and requires more review and active note taking outside of class. In college, you set your own schedule. When are your classes? Do you attend? When do you do your homework? Eat, see friends, play music, sports. You have a lot of open time and space. And this is very challenging for kids with ADHD because A, people with ADHD have time blindness, particularly young people. You don't actually feel what time is. And because kids with ADHD struggle with organization and time and organization are of course related. So it's easy to get overwhelmed. You also lack parents who are monitoring you or keeping you on track. That can be a pro and a con. And the content of what you're learning may be treated differently in college. The expectations of what you're gonna manage on your own are generally greater. So this overwhelm that you feel can, in, can indicate or lead to anxiety, depression, 
substance abuse, isolation, and other challenges for college students. I want to encourage you to seek support services when these things are going on. These are your red flags. Your college will have mental health and academic support. And unlike in high school where everyone can see when you go, go, no one sees in college. No one cares because it's not all in the same building and there's no shame. People are doing their own thing all the time. So how do you access services at college? And I'm going to slow down here because I really want to make sure you get this. You register with the Student Disabilities Office before or when you arrive for orientation. Of course, it's never too late to do this in your career at the, at the school that you go to. Um, often you need to go to their website, you apply online, you make an appointment. It's really important that you do that. Now, because in college you're over 18, you control the confidentiality, confidentiality of your status at school, who to tell and when. You can use the accommodations without anyone knowing. Not all schools have the same name or programs for students, so make sure you figure out what those are. And here's the deal. The admissions office and the um, a disabil student disabilities office do not talk to each other. So you can't expect that the admissions office is going to contact the um, student disabilities office. I'm going to say SDO because it's shorter um, because you wrote about your ADHD in your essay. Mm -mm. You got to go there. OK, registration is important even if you aren't sure you want the services, because this way they're set up in case it, you know, it doesn't happen automatically. Documentation. This is super important. You need a letter from a health care provider, uh, your, M, your, your primary care provider, whether it's um, a nurse practitioner or a doctor. Uh, you, if you, perhaps if you had testing, you want to have copies of the testing with you. You want to have as much documentation as you can. And that letter needs to state your diagnosis, your treatment history, and possibly recommendations. So if you're in counseling in high school, get a letter from your, your therapist. Or if you're getting, if you have a tutor, get a letter from your tutor. Have the school write something. It's important. Um, now, many of you will go to college having had an educational evaluation in high school. In order for colleges to really honor those um, th that evaluation, it has to have occurred within three years by the time you matriculate into the college. So think about that. Um, or That's my understanding, but check what your specific school requires. Um, the office, uh, the SDO uh, office, uh, may notify a professor uh, for approval of accommodations without specifying your diagnosis, so you don't have to worry that your professor is going to know more about you than you want. And the accommodations offer you the support you need to complete assignments or tests based on fairness. You're not going to get modifications so much in college, which change the assignments or the tests themselves the way many of you might have in high school. So what are some typical accommodations in college? Um, you'll, I've, you'll, you see these here, uh, testing, note taking, audio or video recordings, uh, priority registration for classes, extended time, access to voice recognition or text-to-speech software, and on sometimes on-campus housing preferences. Um, these testing accommodations will be based on your previous needs and services. And of course, sometimes you may get assistive technology for reading, and that's something you absolutely want to ask for. The note-taking services in particular is anonymous and very helpful. I had a client who uh, basically needed a note-taker and forgot that she had um, that accommodation and when I asked I said don't you have accommodations at college he's like oh yeah like well let's get those accommodations in action let's get those things written down it's important for you to learn how to advocate for yourself so take a look at these questions maybe take a picture and ask yourself what are your academic strengths and challenges 
you need to learn how to attend this meeting, a meeting about you, and engage in the process. And this should start in your last year of high school so you can practice it before you have to do it on your own. Or you can review what you're going to say with a parent, a trusted friend, or a therapist. Identify your strengths and challenges. Write these down. Take a minute right now and think about what are the challenges you encounter during classes and outside of class related to school and life management. I really want you to write down. Take a piece of paper and run a line through the middle. Challenges on one side, strengths on the other. I mentioned earlier connected independence. This is when you allow or you invite your parents to assist and coach you or even phone into this meeting to give history to the person who's going to be deciding the kinds of accommodations you have. You may not have as much of a memory of what you've received over the years as your parents might. So it's, it, it can be very helpful to have them on board early on and then to have you advocate as you move through school. Remember um, that you will have to explain the challenges you face in college and why you need the accommodations. Um, if you need assistance identifying your challenges, if you do not have a diagnosis for ADHD, a learning disability, or something else, you can re request from your college a referral for an evaluation. Individual schools have their own policies about how to pay for these evaluations, um, but if you think this might be going on and you need an evaluation, I want you to pull up your bootstraps and walk in and say, I need help. Talking with your professor. So you may or may not have, have experience on how to advocate for yourself. Some of you might, some of you maybe a little, and some not so much. So the one thing I want to say is one of the things that doesn't work in college is if you go up to the professor at the end of class with the five other people who are standing there and try to talk about this important matter at that time. Your professor may have somewhere to go. Your professor is going to be distracted by the other people who are there. Your professor is not going to give you the time and attention you need. So go to office hours or set up a meeting instead. Explain your accommodation plan once you have one. Discuss clearly and non-defensively what you need to succeed and what's helped you in the past. And if you're nervous about doing this, practice. Do a role play with a friend. You don't have to. You're nervous because you haven't done it before. Yeah, that's just, when nervousness will go down once you use a skill or practice it. So uh, the overwhelm, one of the problems is that overwhelm feeds on itself. So you're already overwhelmed, but you actually need help getting less overwhelmed. But the thing to get you the help overwhelms you. Motivation. So motivation uh, or initiation, which is directly related to motivation. So initiation is, um, is, is basically thwarted by procrastination. And the way that we deal with procrastination is to break tasks down into small achievable parts. No size is too small. And you want to notice and reward your efforting and successes by being kind to yourself. You put the have to before the want to. So me, I have dinner, I'm relaxing, I really want to go watch my TV show, but instead I have to clean the dishes. So I know that if I do not clean the dishes before I watch my show, I'm not going to clean the dishes. So I force myself to clean the dishes and then I can really chill out when I watch my show. And this is the same thing with the tasks that you need to do in your life. You put the have to before the want to. You study for 30 minutes and then you take a timed five minute break with a snack, maybe checking your, checking your Snapchat or your Instagram, whatever. And then you go back and you do another 30 minutes. And then when you're done that, maybe you can take a longer break. So we want to try to set that up for yourself. You want to have a daily guideline of what to do with notifications, whether it's a banner that flies across your, your screen or alerts and alarms on your phone. 
this use technology to help you this is a great tool it's a distraction but it's also a tool and i have found tremendous success in teaching teens and young adults to use their phone to organize their lives finally a lot of people with adhd feel like they need a fire under them to get something done and that's because if you wait till the last minute what kicks in is adrenaline and guess what adrenaline does it actually fuels anxiety so now anxiety and cortisol is what's motivating you and this actually depletes your brain so what i would like you to do to think about is you know consider that there are different types of procrastination there's perfectionism you got to get it right or you're not going to do it there's avoidance i hate doing it it seems enormous it's mount everest i don't want to do it and then there's productive procrastination which is my favorite which is i do other things i need to do but not that big task that i don't want to do that i'm avoiding so think about what kind of procrastinator you are what you do to procrastinate and what you'd like to do differently how you can flip it on its head finally um because technology is imperfect you want to make sure you have options if your technology glitches. Um, you want to make sure that your teachers are presenting information in bite-sized chunks on an online platforms. And if they're not, ask them. Ask teachers to ask your teachers, your professor, to be really explicit about what technology or tools will be needed to complete a specific learning task. Just like they would list the materials for an assignment in person, will they do the same? They need to do the, will they and should they, yes, do the same for online learning. Uh, time management. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm run through these a little quickly because I have so much that I could say and we only have an hour and I wanna make sure there are time for questions. So time management, I said earlier that ADHD brains often suffer from time blindness. You don't feel time. And time responds very well to direct instruction and cues because ADHD brains are now not now brains. If I'm doing it now, I'm into it. What's gonna happen later, I don't exactly know. Um, so what I want to encourage you to do is to use external clocks, timers and alarms, analog clocks so you can see time move. I'm a huge fan of the timed timer. I wish I had stock in this company. But you set it for a certain amount of time, so you could do a work, a work period, and it's a white face, and you see the blue, and then the blue fades away as the time passes, and you're like, oh, okay, you can see how much time you have left. This is a great tool to help you organize yourself and estimate and see how long things take. Remember, with time, we want to be just as intentional about what we're not doing as what we are going to do. There's an electronic version of this, um, uh, of a timer. It's called the tomato timer. You can put that right up on your screen. Now, organization and prioritizing are something that everyone said is an issue for them. So organization and prioritizing go hand in hand. And really, there's no way to organize yourself. And I've talked to a lot of experts about this without lists and using a calendar. That's, that's how you're going to organize yourself. And I really encourage you to go to the Student Disabilities Office and meet with people who are executive functioning coaches to help you create a daily schedule. I do this with all of my college clients. We sit down, I have a regular old paper calendar, and we have a, or the, an online calendar, whatever they want, and we write down when assignments are due when they're going to do the reading for their class, when big projects are due, when they need to get started. We work forwards and backwards. Okay, this is very important. Organization and prioritizing affect your understanding of how to use time for chores, assignments, and studying. How are you organizing your space, your materials? You know, what, what, what documents do you put in what files? Are you using notebooks? How do you organize your electronic life and your in-person life? Do you are you someone who who like really you know um, vibrates with color? 
Do you like to have things alphabetical? What works for your brain? That's what's most important. You know, whether you want to have all your, cl your clothes organized, all the shirts here, all the pants here, all the dresses here, or you want to do it by color, all the purple stuff here, all the green stuff here, it doesn't matter. It's what makes sense to you. And this is what we want to think about when you're struggling with organization. So you want to make an ordered list. A lot of kids with ADHD can do a brain dump of the stuff they have to do, but then they can't prioritize it. What goes, when do I do this? What's most important? I have so much to do, I'm overwhelmed. So this means I want you to think about the urgent and important issue, okay? Some things that ur something that is urgent has to do with something that is time-based. Something that is important is a value. And if you have a chance, Google the Eisenhower matrix. It's the urgent important matrix. And it divides these into four quadrants. And you can see how each of them is laid out and what kind of tasks you can do in those. Uh, maybe I'll come back soon and I'll, ta I'll do my presentation on motivation where I explicitly go into how to prioritize. Um, you want to set up a strategy for approaching your homework or other tasks with the best order. So some people like to do the hard thing first, get it out of the way. Some people want to do the easy thing and get on a roll and then do the hard thing. What's hard for you? What's easy for you? Not what other people think, okay? And when you have all your stuff out, the list of what you need to do, edit it in terms of prioritizing deadlines. Okay, when is this due? When is that due? Hmm, I have to have this, you know, I have reading for this class. When am I going to do that? Put it down. Make things different colors. Be creative with it so you'll use it. Okay, and if this is hard for you, and I suspect it might be, get some help. There is nothing embarrassing about doing this. I do this with kids in high school. I particularly do it with college students and young adults because they're still learning. And I even do this with 50-year-olds who get overwhelmed easily because of their ADHD. You can expect to learn these skills over and over again. Now, this is a time of great anxiety, and I wanted to say a few words about this. Anxiety is experienced cognitively and physically. Uh, we, um, it reflects all or nothing thinking and a negative expectancy. And the top predictor of depression in, in kids and young adults is untreated anxiety, often due to peer isolation. Your goal is to become a little bit bored by your anxiety, not frightened by it. And so here's what you can do. Instead of saying, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Instead of saying, I'm worried about, could you say, I wonder about? Is this a real concern or am I overreacting? Because anxiety is a process of overreacting to a concern, okay? Control what you can. And think about and rely on past successes to fuel your confidence about your future, your present and future concerns. Now to overcome potential obstacles, we wanna nurture resilience and reduce shame. I have yet to meet anyone with ADHD, whether you're five, 15, 25, or 50, who doesn't have a sense of deep-seated shame about having ADHD or being different from their peers. And this shame often starts early in life and continues into adulthood. Sometimes the shame is obvious. You can't seem to make friends. Maybe you don't write as well or easily as your peers. Parenthetically, writing requires all 11 executive functioning skills, which is why it's so hard for many people with ADHD, and an emphasis on organization and time management, end of parentheses. <laughs> um, uh, maybe you space out at your desk in school and the teacher used to call on you or tease you. Maybe it's more hidden. Maybe you're, you know, sort of brag about your, your, your video game uh, accomplishments um, and you're good at basketball, but 
when those tests come back, you shove them, you, you, you try not to look at them and hide them away. Or maybe you procrastinate endlessly before doing your homework. Many people with ADHD expect to hear negative comments about themselves. And this comes from a lifetime of hearing about how you could be different, i.e. better, if you did this, this, and this, none of which were easy. For many people with ADHD, it's easier not to try and fail than to try and fail. And this perpetuates a low self-esteem. The learning process happens over time by reminding yourself of the ways that you actually have succeeded in the past or overcome challenges in spite of worry or hardships. This is your resilience. And anxiety is super talented at erasing memories of courage and triumph. So we want to see mistakes as learning opportunities. I know that sounds corny, but it's true, right? If I'm living, I'm learning. If I'm not learning, I might be in that pine box. Acknowledging your vulnerabilities as areas for improvement instead of character flaws. Don't do a whole trip on yourself about what a loser you are because you struggle with, you know, managing your time or keeping your room neat or getting back to friends in a timely manner, okay? Find a purpose to your life, something you enjoy. Remember that you make a difference. Think of the people in your life who really, who care about you, who love you. We have to let that in sometimes. And finally, the most important thing is focus on what you can change. You can't change everything at the same time. Do you know how many things people can change at one time? One, maybe one and a half if you're lucky. Focus on one thing, pick that one thing. So moving forward, I wanna encourage you to use the PREPS method. This is something I came up with and it's an acronym so you can remember it. P, pursue services and accept help. R, represent yourself fairly. Be honest about what you need. E, educate yourself and others about ADHD and executive functioning skills. There is so much misinformation out there and false assumptions. You, you need to champion your own cause. Plan for what you need and set aside shame and focus on that growth mindset. That mindset that says, I'm gonna try something, it may work, if, it, if that's great, if it doesn't work, I'm gonna regroup and try something else. How much time should I spend organizing my calendar? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I feel like spending, um, th that, that in the beginning of each semester, that could take an, a couple hours, um, but it's well worth it because your entire semester will now be laid out for you. Um, if that's too much of a task, then start with one class at a time. Um, just do one class and lay that out. And, you know, I mean, the thing is you don't want to go crazy with the calendar. I mean, I have people who highlight and, you know, color and everything. That could take a lot of time. You want this calendar to be effective, um, but you don't want to go overboard. So I would suggest you take, um, you know, it should probably take about an, uh, um, you know, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour per class to just put everything out in the calendar. It's easier if you do it with someone because they'll move you along. Um, so maybe if you have a friend who also wants to set up a calendar for the semester, I would encourage you to sit down and do it together because you'll, you'll, you'll move through it a little faster. Is your organizational system too complicated? I would encourage you to think about what might be simpler than the one you're doing because if you're not using it then that tells me that it's a little bit too much for you. 
So I would thin that out a bit. And again, I would say it might be helpful for you to use bins instead of drawers where you can see your clothes. I had one client who took all her books off her bookshelf and put her clothes on her bookshelf so she could see her clothes so that she didn't have to pull the stuff out of the drawers. Someone else I know got one of those racks, you know, that you can get and they hung their clothes up there so they could see them. Um, and, you know, you could create a policy where at the end of every day you pick up three things from your floor, something easy that you can achieve. Um, because what happens is when the room sort of starts to kind of like melt into a huge mess, it's overwhelming. And then you're back facing Mount Everest, like, ugh, why do I want to clean that? Whereas if you could either take, you know, say, okay, every other day I'm going to take 10 minutes and just pick up what's on my floor, that might be easier for you. Most embarrassing part of ADHD is people thinking I don't care when I sleep through class. Oh no. Deciding I, I can't make myself uh, get to class, get to class late, turning in assignments late. So um, if you're you know, sleeping through class, I would imagine that is embarrassing and turning things in late is embarrassing. So you need accommodations. There's no question that you need accommodations. You might need um, extra time, some extensions on some assignments. Um, maybe your medication isn't working if you're sleeping through class. You know, I would encourage you to, to seek services. The most embarrassing thing for me is teachers discussing in front of the class, discussing me in front of the class. Now all the kids know I have ADHD. All right, I just want to say to whoever wrote this, this makes me so mad. I'm sure you can see the steam coming out of my ears. It makes me furious. That is a total violation of your privacy. And no teacher should do that. And if your teacher has done this, then I encourage you to talk about that with your counselor at school or someone in the disabilities office, because that's not okay. That's not okay. That's like outing someone. We don't do that. And you got outed. And that's not cool. Okay. <laughs> My daughter rushes and is a box checker to get things done. Any tips for that? Um, you know, I think if she wants to rush and get things done, she's she has not yet become invested in in the um, the consequence of what she's doing, and she also may not know what else to do, um, and particularly for things that aren't interesting because interest fosters motivation. Um, she wants to get through that the stuff she doesn't like to get to something that she does. And so we may want to try to separate what are the things that are um, that she enjoys that she might want to spend more time on and have different goals for that than for the things that she doesn't enjoy. And someone asks, um, how do you go about setting aside shame? Shame is so big. And because, you know, I mean, we're all familiar with Brene Brown. And, you know, Brene Brown says shame, the difference between shame and guilt is shame is I am bad versus guilt, I did something that was bad. And so when there's shame, I feel like shame for people with ADHD is actually a compilation of trauma. A thousand little paper cuts that have accumulated into one huge negative voice telling you, you stink. Um, and that takes time to unravel. And honestly, it takes good therapy. Um, someone who actually can help you, you know, put on some glasses that are maybe rose colored and see what you're doing that actually is great or good or good enough. Because what I see in people with ADHD is that the negative um, statements that they hear from people or say to themselves far outweigh the positives. Dr. Barbara Fredrickson and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania studied positivity, and she found that the ideal ratio are three positives for every negative. I talk about this in my book. And I call that, and I, I, one of the five C's that I created is celebration. It's not baking a cake for yourself because you do your dishes, but it's actually about noticing when you do something that goes pretty well. And having adults and caring people in your life notice that too. When I've traveled all around the world and I've talked to people with ADHD and the ratio that I hear from them 
is one positive to anywhere from 10 to 50 negatives because they add in all the things they say to themselves. I would start with uh, reading some Brene Brown and I'd also start with maybe with finding a counselor who understands ADHD. This is important. What about keeping your prescription drugs safe in your room? Uh, if you're going to keep your pres prescription drugs in your room, I get a lockbox. I just get a lockbox um, because you don't want to worry that anyone else on the floor is going to take them and you just lock them up and keep them in a safe place. And hopefully if you live with a roommate who you trust, you know, you can have an agreement about it. Um, and if you live, if you have a single, lucky for you, and then you don't have to worry about it so much. Um, my 20 year old daughter needs help with her LD. What type of therapist would be best for a young adult? I think a therapist that would be best for a young adult is someone who's curious about their experiences, who offers empathy, and is not afraid to brainstorm with your daughter about solutions to the challenges that she's facing, and sometimes maybe even give advice. I work with a young adult who, um, who you know, took AP classes in high school, and she um, went to a private college, and uh, and her, you know, basically, um, out of four classes in her fall, she passed three, barely, and then in the spring she was failing, got super depressed, never left her room, and came home. She's now going to community college and um, she's taking a writing class and she has to do some reading for the class. And we started to unpack a little bit her relationship with reading. And what I learned is that reading is hard for her. And I had her talk about specifically what happens when she reads. And then what she said is, I, what I said to her is, have you ever used a Kindle? She said, no, I gave her my Kindle. I loaned her my Kindle so she could make the letters super big and have fewer letters on a page. Guess what? Reading was easier. Someone who listens. Um, embarrassing aspect about ADHD would be spacing out, misunderstanding social cues and feeling that I'm not as intelligent as others. Okay, ADHD has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with the neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine and your brain just doesn't make a sufficient amount of these. And so you're probably quite smart and you cannot control the drift, it's unconscious. What you can control is what happens when you come back from Bermuda or you know your ideal lunch or whatever you're thinking about and what you're gonna do to catch up. And that's where I'd like you to put your emphasis. Um, I'm not a big fan of my parents getting largely involved in my schoolwork, that's fair. And I'm also worried that at least one of my parents will also want to get involved in my college life. Hmm, fair also. What do I do in that situation? And how do I respectfully tell my parent or both my parents that I do not want them to be largely involved in my college life? Well, you're clearly a very bright and articulate person. And so what I would do instead of just like giving them big heave ho is I would say, hey, you know what? I would really like to try managing my academic life in college on my own. So I'm gonna make an appointment with the Student Disabilities Office. If you can make sure I have all the paperwork that I need, um, that would be helpful. And, um, and that will include any IEPs or 504s you had in high school, which specified the accommodations that you had. And I think as long as you get services to help you make the transition, because it's a big transition from high school to college. In high school, you largely manage your academics and your school life and your social life, but your basic needs, food, um, housing, uh, you know, laundry maybe even, um, whatever, are taken care of by your parents. When you go to college, you now have to manage life, and school and sometimes that can be a tough balance for people so you want to make sure that you have all the supports in place to help you be successful and what's the difference between a coach and a therapist which is better for a student well coaches and therapists are different um, uh, i think that a coach really focuses on what's happening in the present 
um, and teaching you tools for um, the challenges that you're having. Um, an executive functioning skills coach, for example, teaches you how to work with executive functioning skills. A therapist takes a more holistic approach. So they, um, if a th and some of them understand how to teach executive functioning skills and some of them don't. So if you're seeking a therapy to deal with living with the challenges of ADHD, some of the emotional or social issues that you're having, um, problems with your family or, um, or people you're dating, uh, as well as managing um, the overwhelm of living with ADHD, that can work out great. Um, I am a, I'm a psychologist and I also teach executive functioning skills to my clients because I think it's important to do a dance in therapy between the emotional stuff and the practical stuff because that's how people with ADHD are going to mature into self-reliant adulthood. I struggle with keeping a regular sleep, eating, exercise, those type of things mostly because it's hard to get started working earlier in the day. So mm -hmm. I think he just wants you to speak to that. And it is our final question. Okay. So sleep is so important for everybody and particularly for college students. And it's so hard to do because your, you know, your adolescent uh, time clock, your body clock in your brain is set at the, you know, later in the day. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is if you want, you know, if you want to try to have more daytime hours, I'm working with someone now. And what we did was we started to work slowly backwards on when bedtime was. And the way we did that was um, I asked him to text me when he went to bed. And we had an agreement like I'm going to go to bed around between 12 and 1. And so Sometimes he does it, sometimes he doesn't. But then he started tracking when he's going to sleep. And it was very hard for him to understand that when he wakes up is directly related to when he goes to sleep. So um, in terms of your, you know, doing your work, um, what I think would be, would be helpful is, um, is to have a plan for your day. Like I go to class, then I work out, I have lunch, and then I do some of my studying in this time, and then I take a break, and then I do some more of my studying so that I can have free time from, you know, 11 to 1 or something. Um, because if you go to sleep at 1, then, you know, you sleep till 8. It's not bad. So I think the important thing is actually working with when you go to sleep, not when you get up. And also to try to break down your work um, so that you're not leaving it all to the last minute because um, that's a struggle for you. So use your phone, set timers, set alerts, and get some study buddies. Study buddies are great to help you stay on track. Thank you so much for joining me. Please check out my website, www.drsharonceline.com, for all kinds of resources. I also have a lot of videos on YouTube. Uh, and follow me on socials um, where you'll be kept up to date of various workshops and other things that I'm doing.